we're going to start the morning by hearing from our chairman, CEO, Dr. Olson is uh, going to say a few words, and uh, we're grateful you're all here. Uh, this is a, an exciting day for us. Resident Research Day is, is, is a good thing, and I appreciate y'all being here. Dr. Olson. Well, I want to welcome everybody. I was talking to somebody, how many years we've been doing this? Bob, well, it's been over 20 years yes. that we've had this uh, event. I think we go back into the uh, later 90s, as a yes. matter of fact. So it's always a pleasure to allow the uh, residents to essentially, as I've said, strut their stuff, talk about what they're doing, and we get an opportunity to see and understand. Uh, and it's, it's always nice that we actually have two different things, the research project and also their uh, continuous quality of product as well. So uh, that's what our day. We have an incredible, uh, one of our former fellows has gone on to do great things, and we're excited about uh, hearing the message as well on top of that. So. It's a beautiful spring day, uh, and uh, this is one day when we strive not to see patients and others so we can get a chance to uh, really hear and listen to all of these good things. And with that, that I'm going to go and turn it over to Bob. Bob, let's get started. Thank you, Dr. Olson. So we're going to start with our senior residents. First up is Tyler Etheridge. Tyler is going to speak to us about the association of macular pigment optical density with retinal layer thickness in eyes with and without manifest primary open angle glaucoma. It's a mouthful, and hopefully he's going to clarify that whole area. Now, one of the things we're going to do today is, is try to mention a fun fact about each of our speakers. It turns out that Dr. Etheridge played in four college sports. He is matched for fellowship um, in at the University of Wisconsin in Retina. Dr. Etheridge. Hi. You want to tell them what sports? Oh, sure. What sports? What sports? Uh, <laughs> no, so I played uh, cross country, college basketball, indoor and outdoor track and field. And those are two separate sports because you have to qualify for both so yeah it was division three so it's not that impressive <laughs> um so i'm going to present on a project that i was uh have been working on for quite a few years actually um in conjunction with the university of wisconsin's department of ophthalmology um the study collaborators have multiple financial disclosures, but none that are relevant to this talk today. Here's the outline for today's presentation. So we're going to cover kind of the urgent need to identify novel, modifiable glaucoma risk factors. We're going to briefly cover a study called the carotenoids for age-related eye disease study and then cover the evaluation of what's called macular pigment optical density in relation to retinal thickness in eyes, both with and without primary open angle glaucoma within the carotenoids for age-related eye disease study. So as we all know, primary open angle glaucoma is a major cause of irreversible blindness, impacting an estimated 44 million adults globally. The only known modifiable risk factor seems to be intraocular pressure, However, as we all know, glaucoma can continue to progress despite lowering of the intraocular pressure. Primary open angle glaucoma is characterized by death of retinal ganglion cells and their axons, which form the retinal nerve fiber layer, or RNFL. The macula, with its high density of retinal ganglion cells, is increasingly recognized as an early site of glaucoma pathogenesis. Early thinning of the macular ganglion cell complex and the peripapillary RNFL can precede detectable visual field defects within glaucoma. Therefore, it seems that preventing macular ganglion cell complex thinning may help to prevent uh, glaucomatous visual field loss. Conflicting reports exist regarding whether primary open angle glaucoma is associated with lower levels of the dietary carotenoids lutein and zeaxanthin, which form the macular pigment. Lutein and zeaxanthin as antioxidants tend to accumulate in neural tissue, including the retina, particularly in the fovea, and may protect retinal ganglion cells and their axons 
by neutralizing reactive oxygen species and preventing structural uh, and providing structural support. So macular pigment is associated with cognitive function as well as reduced risk of diseases such as age-related macular degeneration and Alzheimer's disease, suggesting its potential role as a novel interventional target for uh, diseases like primary open angle glaucoma. Macular pigment optical density has been positively correlated with the thickness of retinal layers affected in early stage glaucoma in several studies. I'll bet these are all small and case control. Therefore, in this study, we sought to investigate the association between the baseline macular pigment optical density and the thickness of both the, well, the thickness of the macular ganglion cell complex and peripapillary RNFL 15 years later among participants within the carotenoids for age-related eye disease study. That study is an ancillary study of the prospective women's health initiative observational study. The CAREDS-2 study was a multicenter prospective study um, with 15 years of follow-up uh, covering 2,000 women conducted at multiple sites throughout the United States and evaluated the relationship between macular pigment levels and age-related eye diseases. So for our study, the macular pigment optical density was measured at the CAREDS baseline visit between 2001 and 2004 uh, via a process called heterochromatic flicker photometry. Um, the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, macular ganglion cell complex, ganglion cell layer, interplexiform layer, and retinal nerve fiber layer thicknesses were measured at the follow-up visit, the CARES-2 visit, between 2016 and 2019 via spectral domain optical coherence tomography. And then an association or associations between the macular pigment optical density initially in 2001-ish and the retinal thickness uh, later on in 2019-ish uh, were assessed using multivariable linear regression. So the analysis included 742 eyes from 379 women. Uh, participants were predominantly white with a median age at the baseline visit of 65 years. The macular pigment optical density within the baseline visit was associated or positively associated with the presence of an intraocular lens, a larger waist circumference, and a higher body mass index or BMI. Um, so manifest primary open angle glaucoma was identified in 50 eyes or about 7% of the participants um, from 32 participants. Participants with manifest primary open angle glaucoma tended to be slightly older, were more likely to be non-smokers and more likely to have an intraocular lens as well as have lower macular pigment optical density at baseline. Um, compared, uh, compared with eyes without manifest primary open angle glaucoma, those with primary opening of glaucoma had thinner peripapillary RNFL thickness in all quadrants, as um, eyes with manifest primary opening of glaucoma had significantly thinner macular retinal nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, interplex form layer, and total ganglion cell complex thickness in the, both the inner and outer subfields. So among eyes with manifest primary opening of glaucoma, Macular pigment optical density was positively associated with the macular RNFL, interplexiform layer, ganglion cell layer, and ganglion cell complex thickness in the central subfield, but not in the inner and outer subfields. And that's the central subfield is noted here, whereas the outer subfields are more peripheral. Macular pigment optical density was also positively associated with the peripapillary RNFL thickness in the superior and temporal quadrants. So kind of in conclusion, uh, we observed a positive association between the baseline macular pigment optical density and the central subfield ganglion cell thickness measured 15 years later in eyes with and without manifest primary open angle glaucoma. In addition, macular pigment optical density was positively associated with the thickness of the superior and temporal quadrants within the peripapillary RNFL among eyes with manifest primary open angle glaucoma. Our results linking a low macular pigment optical density to retinal layers that are structural indicators of early glaucoma 
provide further evidence that lutein and zeaxanthin may provide, provide protection against manifest primary opening glaucoma. Additional studies are, of course, needed to further elucidate the relationship between macular pigment optical density and the integrity of the retinal uh, layers um, associated with glaucoma, which may facilitate the development of novel interventions for manifest primary opening glaucoma. Um, this study was published in the British uh, Medical Journal Open Ophthalmology, and there are a number of collaborators across the country um, that we have worked with on this project that all require acknowledgement or or um, should be acknowledged. Um, and at this time, I'll take any questions. I think we're doing questions. Yes. In the after, yeah. It's a lot of words. Sorry. Go for it, Dr. Warner. But yeah, so the the impetus for the study for me was initially thinking about whether or not if we could use retinal layer thickness as a predictor for developing age-related diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Um, that was the initial impetus, and that's still ongoing. Um, so far, there are other age-related diseases that are associated. So it's we tried to parse out those individuals who had, for example, macular degeneration um, or were likely to develop macular degeneration, as well as those who had who possibly had clinically diseases like Alzheimer's disease, and patients with primary opening of glaucoma still have thinner retinal layers than those with other age-related eye diseases and age-related diseases. So I don't know if that answers your question. Go for it. It would be interesting if, in fact, the carotenoids are protective. If you had patients with, for example, um, a history of an optic, a unilateral optic neuropathy, and compared those, and and they had low levels of dietary and or uh, macular pigment, and then compared those with individuals who had normal, whatever that means, or high levels of macular pigment, and then looked to see if individuals develop thinning of like their RNFL. Um, and those individuals who had low carotenoids had thinning of their RNFL and those with normal levels or high level of carotenoids maybe didn't or something along those lines. I think there's a lot of different ap applications. Dr. Olson. So you always have the issue when you're looking at uh, correlations mm -hmm. that, that they don't necessarily tell you much about causation, right? Yeah. So here's another potential explanation for what's ongoing. Um, you know, the group here in uh, the large cohort that, that has been developed and evolved looking at uh, macular degeneration mm -hmm. have, have found an, an, a very interesting finding in that uh, those who are at risk at uh, complement uh, factor H have a significantly increased, increased risk of glaucoma. Mm -hmm. And it's not subtle. It's, it's like two times. Mm -hmm. So if what we're talking about, because we know macular pigment decreases in association with macular degeneration, and Paul Bernstein has done a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. So it's decreasing, and um, it, it could be related to a lot of processes, not necessarily a complement factor. H could be underlying toxicity. There's all kinds of other issues. Mm -hmm. But that uh, we now know that inflammation is an important part of glaucoma, and we know inflammatory indices are increased you know, for those who are, have risk profile for complement factor H, mm -hmm. therefore that's causing glaucoma. Those two would be concordant, but really have nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just say that's, a, that's another hypothesis. Frankly, knowing, uh, I, you know, we got Dr. Fleckenstein here, but, but the evidence are trying to get it confirmed in another cohort, mm -hmm. but having a hard time getting a really clean cohort with a, a lot of patients who have been very carefully genotyped and phenotyped. Yeah. But I think the evidence that I'm seeing, at least in Monica, you can disagree or agree, but I think it's pretty darn strong that complement factor H risk is also a significant genetic risk 
for, if not open ankle glaucoma, rapid progression. But it certainly correlates with patients with who have verified bona fide glaucoma, and 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 that genetic risk is really quite large. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think Dr. Stagg had a question. Yeah, this is a great presentation, great work. It's a really cool data set that you had access to. That's yeah, like that's really awesome. Um, I had one question. How does it just trying to judge like effect size on the on it? Yeah. How does it compare with like the risk for macular degeneration? We know this these these levels play a role in macular degeneration. Was this like a much smaller effect or a similar effect? It seemed like um I don't know the data in and out for the macular degeneration, but it seemed like a smaller effect, um, the carotenoids level in association with primary opening of glaucoma than it is associated with macular degeneration. But that's just my cursory review of like the AMD data sets or the data, but it seems smaller. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. All right, now our next talk, Brandon Kennedy. And uh, Brandon is going to speak to us um, about our flipped classroom model. I think m many of you know that we've changed our resident education program here. And instead of didactic lectures, we've done a flipped classroom model, largely under the director, Dr. S uh, direction of Dr. Simpson, Dr. Vagunta, Griffin Jardine have been champions of this. And uh, Brandon's gonna talk to us about three-year data about how that is going. Now, the fun fact about Brandon is that he just got engaged. So we need to congratulate him. Now, the other uh, thing to mention is our guest, our distinguished alumni, Arefe Adeshina is here with us. And you'll hear from him and he'll be more formally introduced this afternoon but we are grateful that you're here. Thanks for taking the time to come spend today with us. You're welcome. And welcome home. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. So I have no financial disclosures. And as Dr. Hoffman kind of already acknowledged, this, this project really started quite a few years ago and Dr. Vigunta Simpson, Petty, or Jardine, really champions of this. So acknowledgments to them. Um, I'm here kind of just presenting some, some longer term data. So first we'll start with some background. So as many of you are familiar with our previous kind of education um, up until 2019, our resident education curriculum comprised of kind of just morning daily lectures, traditional format, seven to eight every morning, no required pre-reading outline or really much guidance. And this was the more passive traditional style lectures. And in addition to that, we also had quite a few other extracurricular activities, which is very common, but this is again, on top of daily lectures and residents working 60 to 80 hours a week. So this ultimately led to resident and faculty kind of mutual dissatisfaction with resident engagement during these lectures, in addition to attendance and also retention of the material that was being presented. So I wanted to present some quotes from residents that were around during this time of these traditional lectures. Here's one. I usually just spent my time preparing for OR during lectures. Never really had time to study for lectures, and I was always lost as a PGY2 or during PGY2 year. I wish I had more guidance on how to prepare for these lectures and the material. To be honest, I just stopped going and I slept in. This is a, a fan favorite. And it's the same lecture every year. So what did we do? We identified a lot of these issues, mainly attendance by residents, which of course would lead to frustration from attendings who are preparing these lectures and only a couple of residents show up. Also confusion, confusion on lecture topics, how to prepare engagement during these lectures by residents. And also residents were kind of ready for something new um, in regards to the learning style of these lectures. So what was the solution? And we have here our Moran Eye Center Shark Tank, our curriculum think tank. And this comprised of five residents, four attendings. And really the goal was to learn about GME education, what we're doing currently, what we can do to kind of improve 
these issues that have um, kind of come come to the forefront. And it was really interesting. So this this team um, they teamed up and they looked at kind of the overall learning theory, how adults learn, and specifically studied this in the in the GME population. And what they found was that um, adult learners learn better and retain more information when there's a more active style of learning and teaching versus more passive. So you can see here at the top, a passive style would be your kind of traditional lecture, um, watching, reading, learning, versus a more active style would be teaching others, actually practicing what we're doing in lecture, having more engaged discussion. And kind of at the, the front of this in the GME world, this was the flipped classroom model or idea, which was still very new at the time. So what is flipped classroom learning? So it's essentially what it sounds like flipped. So the opposite of your traditional learning where you go to lecture, you learn about something, and you go home and you read about it later. The flipped classroom model is where you're actually doing things prior to lecture, learning about this material. You have assigned pre-work or something. You, you lay the foundation, you go to lecture, and then you kind of solidify that and build upon that foundation. And at the time, there was a little bit of research out there in the GME world regarding this flipped classroom model, but nothing really looked at long-term data. Um, and if this is sustainable, if this is liked by residents and um, our providers, this was more so data on how to do this and kind of the perceived um, practices and barriers to this flipped classroom model. However, in, this, in the STEM world, in high school and college, there was a lot of research done, and this is a meta-analysis of over 300 studies back in 2013, which showed um, potential to reduce failure rates in high school and college students when there's more of an active learning style in the classroom. So what happened is our team got together and they kind of imagined this new curriculum where we do have more guidance with learning objectives, assigned pre-work to kind of lay that foundation. And then during lecture, it was more of an interactive style. Um, and this, again, was kind of championed by Dr. Simpson, Dr. Petty, Jardine, Dr. Vagunta, and you can see our prior program director here, Dr. Petty, naming the curriculum after his favorite favorite rodent, the, the, the mole, the Moran ophthalmology learning experience. <laughs> and kind of just highlighting the major changes. You can see before the changes, again, these daily traditional lectures, they were kind of discontinuous, repetitive material, they were being recycled. Um, and this time was also unprotected, meaning that if residents had OR, patients to see, um, they would go do that instead. And that did lead to kind of these attendance issues versus now we're just having a one time every Friday, two to nine um, interactive lecture. The subjects were now taught in blocks. So you were learning about the same thing for a couple of weeks in regards to subspecialty. And then you'd kind of go block by block. Um, and this was a one year cycle. So you're seeing that material more. And this is protected time, which would ideally improve our attendance. And kind of the format we thought of was, again, these learning objectives would be given to residents early on prior to the lecture, maybe one to two weeks ahead, as well as this pre-work assignment. And when they get to lecture, we're, you know, we're held accountable by some type of interactive quiz and then some type of interactive learning exercise during lecture to promote engagement and a discussion to build upon this foundation and then maybe a mini lecture during then as well. So. The goal and why I'm standing up here today is we wanted to evaluate and study, is, you know, is this flipped classroom model something that's working? Do we want to continue to do it? Are residents and faculty happy? Um, and also, are there preferences from the faculty and residents on lecture styles, pre-work assignments? Um, and how much time are we actually spent studying for these lectures and faculty um, preparing for these lectures? So kind of a um, timeline here, the mole committee is formed early. And then in 2019, we wanted to survey the residents and faculty before it's rolled out. It was rolled out in 2020. We have a post one year um, survey and then also a three year survey as well. And that's what I'm kind of focused on today mainly is the three year data. So what we wanted to focus on here, you can see um, kind of faculty understanding of flipped classroom models, resident participation, engagement and preparation. Are people happy with what's going on? Are there barriers to sustainability? Is this something that was just really exciting in the beginning, but it's going to kind of burn out? And also, again, if there's any preferences in regards to the pre-work and active learning modules or modalities. So we had a pretty good response rate. Residents did well. Faculty also did pretty well. Here's some results. So in regards to participation, you can see the pre 
flipped classroom. It was about half and half in regards to minimal to no participation versus moderate to excellent. They can see one year after and three years after that participation increased significantly. So overall, attendings are very happy with the level of participation after this new flipped classroom model. And how much, or, and how about residents? How much time are we spent preparing for these lectures? So I don't have the pre-flipped classroom data up here because essentially the time spent was zero. Um, so the first two columns, it, I did not prepare or less than 30 minutes. However, after you can see residents at the one year mark were preparing at least one to one and a half hours. Then at the three year mark, uh, we decided we wanted to learn a little bit more. And now we're studying um, up to even two hours prior to lecture. And how about on the attending side? Um, one of the initial barriers we were concerned about is, you know, at attendings in their mid to late careers, they've been given the same lectures, they're very comfortable, confident, um, and they don't want to switch to this new flipped classroom model, how much time would this require and so forth. So we looked at the pre-flipped classroom and attendings were spending on average about one to one and a half hours preparing for each lecture. And then at the one year data, this, this did go up quite a bit to more than two hours. The majority of faculty were spent preparing, creating these new lectures, which was something that we kind of anticipated. But interestingly, at the three-year mark, we're back down to what we were before. So maybe faculty, they're getting more comfortable um, presenting this flipped classroom style. Attendance, this is something that stood out to me a lot. So the number of absences have significantly decreased. Unfortunately, we don't have three-year data for this right now. But just for the first-year data pre and after the flipped classroom model, attendance rates increased quite a bit. And this is very notable. And we also have people who hold us accountable now. So if you don't attend, you will get an email, which also helps. <laughs> In regards to um, resident preference for the required pre-work um, activities for this new flipped classroom style, residents preferred um, BCF, BCSC chapters with study guidelines or specific learning objectives, as well as video recordings as their favorite type of pre-work. Um, and then least favorite, least effective in, in their mind, we're just getting a bunch of journal articles to read the week before or online discussion boards. And this is just the preference of residents. And in regards to the preference of residents on what is most effective in regards to the actual lecture and the active learning styles during lecture, residents thought a case-based learning format or oral board style review was most effective and least effective was some type of a role playing situation. And then when we asked attendings and residents, how effective were your prior traditional lectures in relaying information? And at the time, attendings thought during these traditional lectures that it really wasn't as effective as, as they'd like to be in regards to teaching methods. And then once we flipped to the one year and three year uh, flipped classroom models, they thought this was a much more effective style of delivering information to residents. And you can see the same thing here with residents. At the time, traditional classroom, they thought wasn't that effective in regards to learning um, and receiving information, but at the one and three year residents thought this was also uh, much more beneficial, this lecture style. And lastly, we kind of just asked a blanket statement at the three year mark to residents, would you rather just go back to this flipped class or go back to this traditional style? Is this flipped classroom too much? And about two thirds of them said, no, we actually like the flipped classroom format. We'd like to keep it. And then same thing for attendings at the three year mark. Which would you prefer, traditional or flipped? And again, about two thirds still would prefer the flipped classroom model at the three year mark. And then when we, when we give this discussion, this talk, inter or not internationally, but nationally or at um, conferences, we're always asked about OCAPs, oral boards. So I thought I'd include this data, which is very interesting. You can see about the 2020 years when we implemented this, um, COVID, all the scores were thrown out, but you can see a quite a significant increase here in regards to the OCAP performance after this flipped model um, was, was implemented. So this is all preliminary data. Um, and then I substratified it by PGY level. And I thought, interesting, I th it looks like the PGY twos and threes are benefiting most from this flipped classroom model once you substratify the data. But again, this is all preliminary. So overall takeaway points, Flipped classroom curriculum can improve faculty and resident satisfaction, participation, and attendance. Um, three years after the curriculum change, roughly two thirds of residents and attending still do prefer this flipped classroom style. And of course, feedback, you know, 
having this data is very important to sustain this curriculum and to learn if it's even sustainable and if we should even be doing this in the first place. So thank you everyone for, for helping with the feedback. And in addition to that, oral boards and OCAP performance may also be in increased with this flipped classroom style. Just quickly here, a lot of national interest, Dr. Vigunta Simpson, have they done a really good job. Um, we've presented this multiple times. Um, and then here you can see myself and Dr. Hu and Dr. Patel presenting this at AUPO a couple times. Moran Core page is also very involved. We had a lot of questions. This is a great resource for, for other departments. You can see a young Jeff Petty there, beardless, still looks good. And then <clears throat> trying to go to the next one. There we go. And we even have a mole award. So we'll be giving this out at graduation. So looking forward to that. And lastly, just some other notable mole projects from the same kind of curriculum of individuals. Uh, they've, they've done a lot. So I want to just to shed light on that. It's an awesome team to work with. Here's a QI code for more information. And again, thank you to everyone who has participated and kind of got this project up and running. Questions? In, in my defense and possibly the mole's defense, uh, it, it's not a rodent. It is a blind mammal, which I don't know if it is any better for the name of an ophthalmology curriculum. Uh, you know, there's so, so many people have done so much for this. And, and really, I do want to just acknowledge faculty rewriting lectures, uh, transforming them into engaging, you know, uh, forms of, of teaching, training, conversation is, is really, really difficult. And that, 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 that I just have to say, I mean, I, I know what, you know, Chai has done and Griffin and others, and, and it takes a lot of time. And so that, that was, in fact, as we've kind of presented this around the country and this has been presented at, uh, in San Francisco at Mayo and when I was just in, um, well, just in Iowa, same thing. A lot of questions about this. They're always asking, "How did you get the faculty to do it?" So that's just that's just a really, it's an acknowledgement uh, of the faculty. I do have just a, a comment question. I've had a hypothesis that eventually the pendulum might swing and the residents may start feeling like we really would just like more lecture. It's interesting to see the two thirds, one third. You know, there's always the grass is always greener effect as well. Just wanting what you don't have, the fear of missing out. But I'll be curious in the next few years to see if there's a little bit of a pendulum swing back. But thus far, it's holding. And thankfully, OCAP scores, which is really a credit to how much time you spend, probably more so than the curriculum. Um, it's really been impressive to see you guys put the time in. So thank you. Thanks, Dr. Petty. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't take any credit for this. I think it's a, a great step forward, but I get asked the same question. How are you getting faculty to do this? Um, we've known in the lecture series that it's the one who lectures that learns the most about that particular subject. Right. So uh, it's not a stretch to think that if everybody's preparing and involved, then everybody's going to learn more about the overall subject. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, um, and it's certainly evolved. And we have people around the country looking at us in regards to this. So I think all of those are positive. So let's keep up the good effort. And we should always remember that um, wherever we are doesn't mean we can't change. There may be tweaks on this that, you know, it could be better. I, I don't mm -hmm. I don't have to say anything off the top of my head, but uh, this should be something that's evolving. And the whole thing is to try to get as much important information for the residents as efficiently as possible, because they're plenty busy already, right. with as with as little um, expenditure of time. And you can't do it with without anything, but uh, um, I think that this is clearly a step forward. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Polsky. Not sure if this is. Oh, there we go. So I was just curious. Um, have you uh, stratified by PGY level for the um, for how people feel about this type of lecture one in three years after, because I think kind of the general consensus being on the mole committee the past couple of years for me has been that PGY twos tend to appreciate kind of a didactic 
portion, which we've tried to incorporate more of just because they have less experience with the material, whereas the PGY threes and fours, I think are a little more comfortable with like their knowledge base and then applying it to case-based lectures. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We have not, and we will once we kind of finish this, we're writing up the manuscript right now. I think that's a very interesting point. And I think you could also argue the opposite of, I think it benefits the PGY 2s and 3s the most because that's the largest learning curve. And once you're a PGY 4 and you know the material pretty well, you got you know you start asking yourself, do I really want to spend three hours preparing for a lecture that I, I, I know pretty well? So I think both sides of the coin have interesting discussions and it would be interesting to stratify that data and kind of see who's voting for what. So great point, yeah. Quick comment in the question. Mm -hmm. Um, I think those of us in pediatric ophthalmology were especially concerned about adult faculty members changing because we know how quickly neuroplasticity kind of tapers off. So this was very impressive. So much changing in adulthood. The um, the question is, what do you see any? I mean, I think we should ride this way for a decent amount of time because I think this is a pretty high level of uh, teaching format. But do you see any other next steps? Yeah, I think what Dr. Olson was getting to is just having an open mind and continuing to get feedback and critique this as we go. I think kind of burnout of this project is is something that we all considered. Um, and then moving forward, next steps, I think continuing to diversify the lectures. I know now they're more interactive, but that's compared to the prior lecture. So if we're still giving the same you know, interactive lecture each year, I think residents uh, are the same thing's going to cycle through as where they, you know. So, um, Next steps, I, I think to answer your question straight forward, just continuing to incorporate feedback that we get from residents and faculty and be open-minded. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I need to mention that uh, Brandon is headed uh, to OHSU in Portland to do retina next year. Um, and now our next speaker, uh, Tony Mai. Tony is going to talk to us uh, in an area. He's going to go uh, to Vance Thompson Eye Center to do a glaucoma fellowship. And he's going to speak to us about four plus year outcomes with GAT procedures. I need to mention his fun fact. Um, Tony, uh, Tony, there's a drink, his favorite drink involves curdling milk. So if anyone has milk curdling in their fridge, please call Tony. He has a use for it. Dr. Mike. <laughs> I have to clarify on that. It's uh, <laughs> clarifying drinks, which the process includes curdling milk. Uh, but you do you do remove all the milk curdles. So, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Tony. And uh, this is a project I've been working on over the past couple of years. I presented it last time, um, but that time we didn't have the uh, data completed yet, which actually was just done recently, submitted, and we just got, some, we are getting some of the data back right now. So I'm pretty excited to share this to you hot off the press. Uh, so I don't have any financial disclosures. And just going off the background real quick, uh, the GAT surgery is a glaucoma surgery. Uh, it stands for gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy, and it's a big mouthful, so that's why we just call it the GAT. Um, and it was described by Grover in 2014. It's a MIGS procedure, which is a minimally invasive glaucoma procedure. And what it does is that it in, uh, increases aqueous outflow by cleaving the trabecular meshwork 360 degrees. Now you can actually do this less than that. And there are many times where we do 180 or 270, just depending on the anatomy. Uh, this is performed ab interno with the help of a gonioscope. And this is uh, compared to ab externo, which was the more traditional version before that. And so how this works is that you make small incisions first in the cornea and then in the trabecular meshwork, you pass a suture or a catheter through both incisions into Schlem's canal. And then that's threaded 360 degrees all the way around. You grab the tip that comes out on the other side and basically like a purse string, you pull both sides or more like you pull one side and it really cleaves the entire uh, meshwork. And so these are just some pictures here showing first the uh, main corneal incision. Uh, this is a schematic of the trabecular meshwork and there you use a little blade to open up a hole in the trabecular me uh, meshwork. This is just a small goniotomy. And then you pass a suture in 
through the mesh work and another schematic here going through uh, the opening that you've made. Uh, you pass it all the way around, grab the other side, uh, pull one, and then that cleaves the whole trabecular meshwork. And this is pretty normal to have some hyphema after. And so how has this surgery done over the past decade, since it's about 10 years now, uh, since it was first performed and described, and comparable to the prior traditional trabeculotomy, this is a picture here where ab external coming from outside of the eye and using this is something called a trabectome it's like a metal uh, device where you slip it through shum's canal and then actually manually rip open the uh, trabecular meshwork but you couldn't do this all 360 degrees easily just from that one access point though uh, so now it's been used and described in many different um, glaucoma conditions and they found that there is an IOP lowering effect of between 35 to 40% while it lasts, while the it's considered to have survived. Um, but I'll show you later that actually the failure rate starts to climb after two years. And so we've had some big landmark studies for this procedure. Uh, the first one by Grover, and that was described in 2014, showed a 40% decrease in IOP after the first year. And they did a two-year uh, follow-up after that, showing that it went down to about 37%. Just last year, Lou released a study showing four years data saying that for those patients who've, um, whose surgery has survived, and there's a strict criteria for this, um, the IOP still stays at a pretty good around 46%, but there is still a big drop off in who survives or not. We'll get to that. In terms of the number of eye drops that's decreased, it's all about 1 to 1.5. That's the amount of eye drops less that they have to use uh, because of this IOP lowering effect. And in terms of failure, there is an increased failure over time uh, to about 50% by the end of four years. And so this is a... Um, uh, failure or survival curve here showing that there is a quick drop off right after the surgery, but then it levels off over time, then steadily climbs to the end of four years. Um, so our question uh, here today, and this is a project that was um, I, I did with Dr. Chaya, and we're trying to find are there um, things that can help us risk stratify patients and predict uh, for certain patients if the GAT can work better or if it is something that will probably fail soon. And so one element that has been used in the past is the visual field mean deviation. Uh, something that has not been used before is actually the RNFL OCT scan. These are the two scans that we use uh, a lot in glaucoma, and so it'll be really helpful to have them before us pre-op and know how is this patient going to do. And so Grover actually looked at the pre-op Humphrey uh, visual field mean deviation showing that anything above um, or worse than negative 15, they tended to do a lot worse and have a high amount of failure just uh, in the first six months. But no one has ever done the RNFL before, and so that's where our study also comes in. And so our study aims to extend this follow-up more than four years because this project actually was started even before me a long time ago, uh, looking at data all the way from uh, when we started the surgery here at the Moran early in 2014 and 15. And so wanted to see how those patients have been doing till today. And we also wanted to correlate the visual field, RNFL, that data to see if uh, that can be uh, useful in risk stratifying patients after the surgery and how they do. So for uh, we looked at patients who had at least four years follow-up, and we looked at their IOP, medications, their failure rates, and then we tried to see if there was any correlation with survival, a couple of different variables. And these are not all the variables, just a couple that we're interested in, such as the RNFL central thickness, the visual field mean deviation, uh, if it was done in combination with cataract surgery, if prior cataract surgery had already been done uh, and the degree of the goniotomy that was done. And so this uh, was IRB approved for retrospective review. We looked at patients all the way from 2012 to 2023. And then um, this was the, the procedure is what we were just discussing the GAT. 
And so I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are just our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, and this was actually done in, in partnership with uh, University of Iowa. And so I uh, was working with them also with some of their patients. Uh, this is through a friend of mine who's working there right now as a resident. Uh, so some of the preliminary results that we just got back recently is that from our combined data, we have about 89 eyes, and this is from 70 patients. Uh, about 44% male, but mostly female and mostly Caucasian. Uh, pretty expected for the population here in both Iowa and uh, Utah. Some Hispanic, Black, Asian, and uh, just a small percent of Native American here and from Utah. Uh, in terms of the type of disease, about 50% was primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, for around 40% was some secondary open angle glaucoma like pseudo exfoliation, pigment dispersion, and then a small amount was mixed and even uh, about two patients had uh, angle closure glaucoma that still was able to have this procedure done. Uh, so if you've noticed, there are more eyes than there are patients. And so actually 19 patients had um, the procedure done bilaterally. And because of our way of modeling statistics, we are able to account for these bilateral um, surgeries. This I cannot describe this to you uh, as above my pay grade, but from what I understand, uh, they are able to link these two eyes together saying that there is some kind of statistical link and then that is um, nullified. So looking at failure, this is the definition that we use the criteria in order to say a patient has failed and they are then censored from our survival curve after. Um, I'm going to move past this slide real quick and explain in a more easy to understand way. But basically, if their pressure did not go down as we expect, uh, if they had high pressure above 21, or if they needed another surgery because they were just getting worse, even if their pressures were doing well, these were all considered failure. So a easier way of understanding is, is what is success? And that is looking at this graph here, the blue portion up top is just that 20% drop that we're looking at. And so if someone dropped, um, say all the way down to 60% uh, in terms of the IOP, that would be considered success no matter if they were on the same number of drops or less number of drops, that was success. But if they dropped less than 80%, say only to 90% of what their pre-op IOP was, but they still were on fewer drops, we would still consider this success. Because for some patients, the surgery was done when their pressure was, say, 17, but it was really done more to try to get them off of drops. And so we want to consider that or take that into consideration also. This is the survival curve that um, was just given to me this previous week. And so this is a follow-up all the way through like eight to nine years of our uh, 89 patients. And anyone who... Um, failed based on the criteria that we had talked about or were lost to follow up. These were censored from further data collection. And so we can see here in that blue um, section that there is a precipitous drop off in survival, actually in the first 1.5 years. And then it levels off uh, for the next year from 1.5 to 2.5. And this is right about 60% survival there and then begins a slow decline all the way through ending at around like I would say about 40% survival uh, at the end of like around eight uh, to nine years. Our uh, preliminary results for IOP shows that the there is a big drop in IOP from about 26 all the way down to, uh, I don't have an average of all of them, but it's around less than 15 for all of the IOPs after. And so showing here the decrease, they're all about uh, what the previous studies have shown about like a 40% decrease. And this is pretty consistent with the studies from Grover and from Liu also. In terms of number of drops, very similar. We do have a big amount decrease from about 2.6 number of drops before surgery to about like 1.3, 1.2 after. And so same right here, all the follow-up that we have after show that this is maintained only for the patients who are still meeting that survival criteria. And this is, again, matches up pretty well with the previous studies. Um, so this is just big 
picture associations here. We're going to dive into this a little bit more with our data analysis. Um, but we wanted to see if there was just like an overall association with some of these variables with failure. And interestingly, uh, we found that um, the RNFL, visual field, and if it was in combination with surgery, none of those came out to be uh, very significant in terms of the p-value. Our statistician said that there was just too much variance there. Um, but interestingly, one did approach and, um, significance, and that was if they had prior cataract surgery. What this tells me is that these patients had standalone uh, surgery, the GAT surgery. It was not combined with um, the cataract surgery. And we all know that cataract surgery itself lends to IOP lowering effects. So if this surgery was done by itself without taking the cataract out, perhaps these patients would not have done as well. Um, and so these are just hazard ratios. At each time point, this risk exists for them. And so what we want to do further next is really to find out, similar to the previous studies, is there like a threshold that we can use, like negative 15 um, that they, Grover, used before to risk stratify patients? So we're still working on that, working on different models to see, is there a number that can help us find out which patients will fail um, or will survive? And so this is just a reminder for the uh, visual field um, that they did before that they found that 15 was the, the, uh, the number that showed worse than that, patients would not do well. So we're still trying to find that there. Um, complications that came up, that was uh, something interesting. Hyphema was expected, about 16% of patients, and it all eventually resolved. But for an IOP spike above 30, actually around 16% too, and they did require more drops, uh, many of them temporarily. Some of them actually led to failure that they had to get uh, extra surgery for. And so just a summary, what do we know so far? In that our survival curve shows that patients um, do have a big drop off in the first 1.5 years to about 60% survival, stay stable, then a slow decline to 40% uh, by eight years. In terms of IOP, pretty consistent with our past studies, uh, there's about a 40 to 45% decreasing effect while they're still meeting that survival um, uh, or failure criteria and then um, their post-op mean is about 13.5. So our next steps is really to continue this data analysis. Um, we want to still stratify the patients between different types of glaucoma, uh, see if there's any correlation with survival, and then also really look into finding threshold values for the visual field, RNFL, seeing if that can help us risk stratify patients. Uh, so this is just our current team right now, both from Iowa and uh, Moran. Uh, I have Dr. Chai here to thank for helping me with this project. And these are all of our acknowledgements for everyone who's helped before. All right. Thank you. Tony, thanks for doing all that heavy lifting. I will tell you that since this technique there, you know, I would say glaucoma specialists in general tend to have things that we rally around consensus, but there are two big camps right now in glaucoma and uh, uh, excuse me for the crassness of the description, but you have stenters and strippers. And basically what it means is that we have a, a group of glaucoma specialists that believe that pathology lies in the TM and if you can strip it away, you can actually restore function. But if you believe Murray Johnstone's work, and I want to acknowledge one of our former glaucoma fellows, Elizabeth Martin, who did a lot of heavy lifting in primate work, looking at the whole distal outflow system. And what they found in Murray Johnstone's work is that it's not a static system. The outflow system is actually not static. It's actually very dynamic. And pulsatile motion of the trabecular meshwork actually contributes to this pumping action of the entire system. And so admittedly, I no longer remove tissue if, unless I have no other choice. I still do it for children where that's our mainstay for pediatric congenital glaucoma. But for the most part, I've kind of moved into the camp that there may be some advantage to maintaining the trabecular mesh work long-term to be able to serve in this pulsatile motion. And if there's a way that we can restore that to create better elasticity and, and not allow the TM to become stiff, that might be the way that we can improve outflow and longevity of our mixed procedures. So this data is important to me though, because it at least confirms Murray's suspicion that over time, 
uh, there may be some competitive disadvantage or disadvantage to actually removing the entire trabecular meshwork or harming the trabecular meshwork. So we haven't figured this all out yet. This is still being studied in, in many different ways. Uh, soon we'll have on the table intraoperative outflow imaging systems that we can use to determine where there are areas that are dormant and maybe areas that are more active. Uh, just clinically on the table, the way I do this now is I tend to do viscodilation as a way to confirm where there are areas that are patent. And you can do that by looking for episcleral blanching on the table. And that will usually guide where I place the stent. Uh, and so, you know, there's there's thoughtful ways to now doing mix it before we would just completely strip the tissue and hope for the best. And it did work, right? In your data set, as you can see, we saw some substantial reductions in, in IOP. But we were all disappointed that over time, those surgeries seem to fail, right? And then we were moving on to a full bypass. But I think we're going to learn a lot more based on work from Murray Johnson and others that we're seeing that the system's actually dynamic. And our therapeutics need to target that and to be able to harness that ability to maintain the dynamic nature of the TM, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Chai. One more question. So, Craig, this is a uh, question for you. The, I know one issue that is always raised is, is it clearly if you're going to, you know, strip that resistance, the fact that pressure would lower substantially is it was would have been surprising if you didn't see it. But because you not only of Murray Johnstone's work, but there was always a concern that w when it does fail, there's something obviously that's healing in that area, in that that this potentially could be elements of scar tissue which makes the overall glaucoma situation worse, not back to baseline. Have we worked out yet if, if indeed we have a subgroup of patients that actually seem to be worse once it's uh, rehealed and, uh, and the procedure has failed? Because I know that was a question that was raised here, you know, what, a decade ago or something. Do we know that, have an answer to that yet? Not really, but the, the issue with trying to find preoperative indicators that might or tend to worse prognosis is to give you a sense that the distal outflow system is already diseased. So taking mean deviation in patients who have a worse mean deviation than minus 15, the thought that that would be a proxy for how diseased the distal outflow system, that's the idea behind that. I think Murray's shown that, you know, when you cause or when you remove tissue from this area, you actually cause some of the osteo to collapse. And there are membranes that can develop. Some people have done some OCT work looking at that. And so trying to make sure you, in the post-operative period, allowing this area to heal properly without a lot of scar tissue is a big deal. Now, the other issue I would say is that interest that we've learned from the GAT work in, in goniotomy work in general is that these patients can still get a steroid response. And we always thought that the steroid response was in the TM. Right. But I think close to 30 percent of Grover's group had steroid response. And what it means is that steroids affect the entire system. Right. And so you have to be careful for that. And so that's why it just encapsulates the idea that while we can intervene at the trabecular mesh where currently we don't have a way to presently intervene downstream. And hopefully in the future, that will be part of MIGS and glaucoma surgery in general that will have ways to intervene further downstream. Uh, there are other questions. Catch Tony. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. That's great. Anyway, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Fleckenstein, who is going to uh, go ahead and uh, move us on to our PGY3 residents. Thank you, Bob. So our next speaker is Ashley Polsky, and she will talk about the influence of historical eye pressure cutoff on current clinical decision making. And um, Ashley once entered a baking contest at her local county fair, and uh, the judges hated her banana bread so much that they gave her a C. And so was, this was actually the lowest grade she ever um, gotten in her life. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> I love that uh, people had such cute uh, fun facts like Brandon got engaged and mine is like, I'm horrible at banking. So <laughs> but we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And here's an overview of what I'll be covering today. Um, I'll first discuss the historical concept of an intraocular pressure cutoff of 22 
and uh, how the distinction between normal and abnormal IOP values initially came about. We'll then go through our study approach and findings, looking at how this traditional IOP cutoff seems to be influencing current clinical decision-making in glaucoma. And to close, I'll discuss some potential directions for future research. So I'll start with a bit of background about intraocular pressure or IOP. For decades, clinicians have commonly been taught the concept that an IOP of 22 or greater is abnormal and warrants treatment for glaucoma. This distinction between abnormal IOP of 22 or more and normal IOP of less than 22 was originally derived from a 1966 survey of a very specific patient population in the UK in which um, a value of 21 millimeters of mercury corresponded to two standard deviations above the mean IOP. And since that study, this concept of an IOP cutoff has really permeated clinical research reports, medical student and resident education, and even some previous uh, national referral guidelines. After that 1966 study, multiple studies over decades have subsequently shown that IOP is a continuous risk factor for glaucoma, meaning that the risk of glaucoma increases with rising IOP, even at levels below 22. Additionally, we now know that many patients with IOPs above 22 will never go on to develop glaucoma, and most patients with glaucoma have IOPs consistently below 22. So in other words, there's no scientific or clinical basis to support an IOP cutoff of 22 millimeters of mercury. However, um, continuous variables like IOP can be challenging for humans to interpret. So we often rely on heuristics or cognitive shortcuts, such as separating continuous variables into normal and abnormal categories in order to simplify this information. And because of this tendency, it's possible that clinicians still use the historical IOP cutoff of 22 to guide their clinical decision making. So in this study, we aimed to determine whether the traditional IOP cutoff of 22 still impacts current clinical decision-making in glaucoma, despite there really being no medical evidence to support such a cutoff anymore. To accomplish this goal, we retrospectively reviewed EHR data from a large ophthalmology data repository called the Site Outcomes Research Collaborative, or SOURCE, between the months of October 2009 and January 2022. The source database contains clinical data from all patients receiving eye care at participating academic medical centers across the U.S., including patient demographics, diagnoses based on ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes, procedures based on CPT codes, and both structured and unstructured or free text data from uh, clinical encounters. So we identified all patients in the source database that had a documented diagnosis of glaucoma in at least three separate encounters um, and who had IOP measurements ranging from 12 to 22 in at least one eye. And because our main goal was to assess for a difference in treatment patterns below versus at this historical IOP cutoff of 22, we did not include patients who had IOP values further above the cutoff, such as IOPs of 23 or more. So patients with IOPs that only fell below 12 or above 22 were excluded from the study, as were any clinic encounters that did not have an associated visit provider, such as tech-only appointments. And the main outcome measure was the initiation or escalation of IOP-lowering treatment after an encounter, which we defined as a new prescription for IOP-lowering medication within one week of an encounter, SLT within four weeks, or glaucoma surgery within eight weeks. We used multiple methods of analysis to evaluate for a difference in treatment initiation at this historical IOP cutoff of 22. First, we simply plotted the rate of treatment initiation at each IOP level between 12 to 22. And we then used a more complex mixed effects logistic regression to model the odds of treatment initiation at different IOP levels. So briefly, uh, we used a total of four different logistic regression models, each with a model-specific indicator IOP that served as the highest IOP value in that model. So for example, in the model with an indicator IOP of 20, the continuous uh, variable in that model included IOP values between 12 and 20. 
And the purpose of this approach was to evaluate for a change in treatment probability that could be attributed to the highest IOP level in order to see if an IOP of 22, for example, is associated with a disproportionately higher probability of treatment compared to IOPs below that historical cutoff, such as IOPs of 19, 20, or 21. And then for each of these four models, we determined the likelihood of treatment initiation um, as a function of IOP represented by an odds ratio. The study cohort was derived from seven different academic eye centers within the source consortium. Um, and after our exclusion criteria were applied, we were left with a total of 94,232 unique patients and nearly 1.9 million clinic encounters for our final study cohort. The average age of patients was 69.5 years, and male patients comprised about 42% of total clinic encounters, whereas the remaining 58% of clinic encounters included female patients. When we plotted the rate of IOP lowering treatment initiation at each IOP level, we found not surprisingly that the treatment rate gradually increased with higher IOP levels. But interestingly, the largest increase in treatment rate occurred at the historical IOP cutoff between IOPs of 21 and 22. The logistic regression models are shown here with each of the four models represented by a different line color. Again, each model included a model specific indicator IOP or a maximum IOP value of 19, 20, 21, and 22. And at lower IOP values, all four models showed pretty similar trends in treatment probability with gradually increasing treatment as the IOP increased. However, the treatment probability disproportionately increased at the indicator IOP of 22 compared to indicator IOPs of 19, 20, and 21. And uh, we can see this difference from the logistic regression models even more starkly when we look at the odds of treatment associated with each of the four indicator IOP values. So at values of 19, 20, and 21, which are all below the historical IOP cutoff of 22, the odds of treatment range between 1.03 to 1.05. Um, on the other hand, at an indicator IOP of 22, the odds ratio increased to 1.11, showing a larger effect on uh, treatment initiation than any other indicator IOP level. We know based on decades of research, as I mentioned, that um, IOP is a continuous risk factor for glaucoma. And providers in our study did seem to utilize IOP as a continuous risk factor to a degree, with increased rates of treatment generally occurring at higher IOP values. However, we also found evidence that the historical IOP cutoff continues to influence clinician decision making in a way that is not necessarily supported by medical evidence, with multiple methods of analysis showing a disproportionate increase in treatment at an IOP of 22 compared to IOP values just below that historical cutoff. Uh, continuous variables are really common in the context of clinical ophthalmology and ophthalmic research. Um, and in the setting of glaucoma specifically, continuous variables like IOP, cup to disc ratio, central corneal thickness, all play really, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, so these continuous variables all play really uh, important roles in understanding the risk of glaucoma development and in guiding treatment decisions. But unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, human cognition and memory are limited, and so it's difficult for clinicians to efficiently and accurately interpret continuous variables, particularly in a really busy clinic setting. And so, um, as I said before, this commonly leads to a reliance on heuristics or cognitive shortcuts in which we uh, simplify data into more comprehensible buckets of information. In recent years, there's been growing interest to understand the role of heuristics in medical decision making. Some research suggests that while heuristics can help to reduce cognitive load and maximize decision-making efficiency, these mental shortcuts can lead to oversimplification of valuable clinical information and can potentially introduce biases that impact uh, actual clinical judgment. 
So in our study, for example, um, providers were disproportionately more likely to initiate treatment at an IOP of 22 versus 21, despite there being no scientific or clinical basis for this distinction, which suggests that this historical and pretty arbitrary division of IOP into normal and abnormal categories is still impacting clinical decision-making to some degree. Um, and because of the, the potential clinical impact of cognitive biases on patient care, clinicians really should be cautious or at least aware of their use of heuristics in making medical decisions. Of course, glaucoma is a really complex disease, and while IOP is often a driving force in treatment decisions, it's rarely the sole influencing factor. Because our data set was retrospective and de-identified, we can't know the exact reasoning of individual providers who chose to initiate or escalate glaucoma treatment. And there's also some potential for selection bias in our study because the source database focuses specifically on academic centers, so it doesn't include smaller independent ophthalmology practices. So some additional studies looking at decision making in private ophthalmology groups uh, could be useful to fill this potential gap. The study also opens the door to some potential future research questions that could be addressed with the source database, for example, looking at how the historical IOP cutoff impacts actual types of treatment that are chosen, such as medical versus surgical types of treatments. And our work also highlights the need for improved clinical decision support tools to better help providers deal with the complexity of glaucoma management and to more effectively utilize continuous variables like IOP in their care of glaucoma patients. And um, Dr. Stagg and others are already working on developing user-focused, computer-based clinical decision support systems that could help to improve the accuracy and efficiency of modern glaucoma care. Here's a list of some of the relevant references. Um, and I want to really thank Dr. Stagg. He's just been um, an awesome mentor over the past few years, and working with him has been a really good experience. Um, and then I have shown here some of our other awesome collaborators who have helped with this project as well. And happy to take any questions. I know I, I I gotta I gotta shut up a little bit. Uh, so it, it, I mean, what we need to understand is is that it's really been a long history that we've defined normal as plus or minus two standard deviations, hematocrit, uh, blood cell volume, uh, lipid profiles are plus or minus two standard deviations, and that's always a simplistic thing. And there's an advantage, right? Because it, one of the more complicated it gets, the more likely people are are gonna gonna miss cues. But we, we know that the, the morbid profile is also a bell-shaped curve, and those two different bell-shaped curves are going to interact on, on, on the higher end. And it's, it's that group that's problematic. It's that group that it's hard to know. And we've got to add another uh, two other th things that are confusing, uh, you know, about the, the work that you show. And number one is, is that there are many people who are diagnosed with glaucoma based upon a single reading of 22 who clearly don't have glaucoma. I've, I've had people who've been on treatment for 20 years. Their pressures have always been actually low normal. I said, let's just stop your drop. I'm not sure if you really needed it. Uh, all I can see is you had one elevated pressure, pressure stayed normal, no evidence of any damage, you followed them along you know, in practice. So, so we have, if you're looking at diagnoses, we certainly have a lot of people who've been diagnosed incorrectly that they have glaucoma. Then we have normal tension glaucoma. <laughs> in which clearly we're never going to have elevated pressure associated with it. And th they're probably a different disease group. And there's a lot of people like Dr. Chai here knows more about it than I do. So that's where, you know, this gets difficult. And that's where I think, you know, the kind of work that our own Dr. Stagg is doing and others is to help us to have a, a better way of figuring our way through here where we can make sure we're diagnosing the right people and diagnosing them early. Because we know treatment, the earlier you get, the better off it is. And uh, um, that, uh, that's in flux. It's important work, but it's it's large databases, sadly, because of some of those problems associated with it, um, make make it you know difficult to, to I think to come to the final conclusions. Very carefully uh, phenotyped groups, both normals and uh, those that clearly have glaucoma, 
Um, and, and now with genotyping, which I know Dr. Stagg with Dr. Hageman is now starting to ramp up with the glaucoma group, I think will really help us a lot to further understand how the, all of those correlate with each other. Thank you. Thanks. Ashley, a great job. You've done really awesome work with putting this all together and, and bringing it all together and writing it up too. Um, so one question I had was, so this historic cutoff um, was taught years ago. Like that, that study was years ago. And for a long time, we've known that like it's, that number is meaningless and yet it still influences decision making. So I, you know, and we're hoping to look at this more, but I was wondering from your perspective as a trainee, like, have you come across that number? Do people like do you like how does how does that how does that persist like from your experience as a trainee? Yeah, uh, all the time. <laughs> In fact, I think many of the previous BCSC versions quoted that specific number as well. The the current, or I think it's the maybe one or two years ago, the BCS version that I have, at least in the glaucoma section, has a more nuanced discussion of that now where they talk about how this was really kind of a statistical concept. And when you look at the actual survey that this was based on, it was a population of patients in the UK that had very little um, like racial diversity. They, they limited it to only patients with ages between 40 and 75. And so it really was a, a specific population that they based this on. But yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's a number that comes up all the time in training. <laughs> so. Ashley, great work. Thank you so much for presenting that. I, I'm going to advocate for Barb. Barb's not here today, but many of us in our group are big believers that IOP is a dynamic number that needs to be studied in a dynamic fashion. So we've been big advocates for doing home tonometry testing on patients. And in our registry that we have, we have a number of patients, probably 10 or 12 ocular hypertension patients who run very tight. You know, they may be mid-20s, but they stay in that range very tightly. And those are patients that we feel are true ocular hypertension patients that probably don't need to be treated. Whereas we have another group of people in that set that are very dynamic in their in their 24-hour IOP curve. And those are patients that we feel are at risk. So our, our impression so far is that when you lose the compensatory mechanisms to modulate and regulate IOP, that may be the canary in the coal mine that tells you this patient's at risk of future progression. Mm -hmm. If we go back and look at OATS and look at that data, we have to remember that in the observation group, it was still only 10% of patients who actually went on to develop glaucoma, right? So Jamie Brandt, one of the lead principal investigators in OATS this year, one of his big warnings to all of us at AGS was over treatment. And with all these new treatments that we have with SLT becoming more first line and mixed therapy, his caution was be careful about over treating patients uh, who are diagnosed with ocular hypertension and elevated pressure. <laughs> Let alone when we start getting eye care. Let alone when we start getting eye care data, and we suddenly have like hundreds of numbers that we're supposed to look at. Like, like we need help with that. I think. Unique to glaucoma. I mean, I measure strabismus, and how do you, how do you decide whether to operate? And then I try to get parents involved in the question, and and they just want you to tell them. So, um, it 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 becomes yeah. Uh, you know, there there's many options and data going both ways, and you try to discuss that with patients, and then they they don't want to even think about it. They just say, "Well, well what would you do?" Yeah, and we want simple answers. Yeah. So our next speaker is Mubarak Mohammed, and he will talk about evaluating refractive outcomes in cataract surgery by residents at the Salt Lake City VA Hospital. And actually, um, Mubarak um, has won two March Madness brackets in his bracket filling career. I had to ask my boys to explain to me what this means. It's obviously huge. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a very big deal. Um, and <laughs> maybe my biggest accomplishment. So. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm Mubarak. I'm one of the second year residents in um, the title of my talk. It's kind of born out of um, Ariane Levin, um, who was a previous resident of my chief when I was an intern year, and then the desire of just kind of um, wanting to see what my refractive outcomes were as I started doing cataract surgery at the VA with uh, Dr. Petty. Um, so we know that achieving optimal um, refractive outcomes is crucial in cataract surgery for um, patients, not only for patient satisfaction, but uh, visual rehabilitation. With these advanced technologies, we're getting more and more precise. Um, previous studies have shown resident cataract surgeons have demonstrated low uh, complication rates and excellent uh, postoperative visual acuity. And uh, studies report um, visual acuities of 2025 or better in um, over 90% of eyes um, in 2040 or better in 95% of eyes uh, in resident cataract surgeries. Uh, training protocols have successfully reduced um, the complication rates as well, as well as the advanced technologies. Um, and the VA is, uh, is kind of an ideal um, place to monitor um, refractive outcomes uh, due to the availability of uh, toric eye wells, as well as any other eye well uh, without cost barriers to our veterans. Um, and then, so this is a picture of uh, me and Amen Neguse, who's uh, one of the interns uh, is going to be starting uh, residency next year. And residents know to not let Dr. Petty uh, have access to their phones while they're operating. So he took a picture of uh, her proctoring me through the surgery. And that's her actually showing me where my paracentesis uh, <laughs> incision was going to be uh, when I couldn't locate it in the scope. Uh, and that patient ended up being 2020 as well. <laughs> um, so again, prior studies have demonstrated success with uh, toric IOLs in resident uh, cataract surgeries and at um, VA hospitals. Um, but the decision-making regarding toric versus non-toric IOLs is also critical for optimizing refractive outcomes. And um, uh, residents, particularly at the VA, have a lot of autonomy as far as uh, you know, looking over the calyx and um, kind of deciding you know, who gets a toric versus a, a non-toric. Um, so uh, while these prior studies have demonstrated a good refractive outcome in, in toric eye walls, uh, you know, focusing solely on uh, those torics might not uh, fully capture the decision making in terms of post-operative refractive outcomes. So the primary objective of uh, this uh, study was to look at refractive outcomes in uh, resident cataract surgeries, both uh, toric and non-torics. Uh, the outcomes evaluated included proximity of uh, post-operative refractions to uh, preoperative targets, as well as residual uh, refractive astigmatism. I also wanted to stratify uh, based on axial length and predictive formulas to analyze uh, factors influencing uh, those refractive outcomes. This was a retrospective study at the VA. Um, compass cataract surgeries performed by uh, two resident surgeons uh, from uh, July of 2021 to May of 2024. Uh, inclusion uh, criteria included um, eyes that underwent uh, phaco emulsification as well as phaco MIGs. The exclusion criteria included history of refractive surgery, LASIK PRK as well as RK. Um, we have the Alcon um, a suite of lenses on consignment at the VA, so all of these lenses were either the SN60WF or the SN60AT, which is a toric version. Um, and then the preoperative measurements included optical uh, biometry, uh, predictive outcomes for toric and non-toric eye wells, as well as the measurement of higher order aberrations. And then post-operative <clears throat> post refraction was measured approximately uh, one month uh, after surgery by either uh, the technicians at the VA or the resident uh, at the VA. Uh, key results again showed um, we wanted to see the proximity of those post-operative refractions to preoperative targets, uh, the residual refractive astigmatism, as well as stratification by uh, axial length and the uh, predictive formulas. Uh, so overall, um, these were um, uh, from 63 patients, 94 eyes, uh, all uh, as far as the um, the uh, resident surgeon themselves, they all had uh, less than uh, 100 cases under their belt. Uh, main, uh, mean patient age was 75 years old. Uh, about 53 eyes were without any major ocular comorbidity. Um, if you work at the VA, that might be a surprise because it seems like everyone has like dry eyes, um, but uh, we did not include that. And then 26 eyes with some sort of retina issue, either AMD, uh, DR, history of RVO, uh, eight eyes with corneal uh, comorbidity, including keratoconus, and then seven eyes with glaucoma. And these are kind of the baseline uh, measurements as far as axial length, um, which was uh, around 24.1 on the left there. Uh, preoperative astigmatism, uh, about a, one diopter. You can see uh, the distribution of width and against the rule as well as oblique astigmatism in these patients. And the average uh, higher order aberration, which was 0.6 uh, and relatively higher in this population. 
of the 93 eyes included in analysis 73 had um, placement of monofocal uh, non-toric eye wells, as well as um, 20 eyes with the toric. Um, and then the closeness of the preoperative for prediction to the refractions is shown below. Uh, overall, 93% of eyes were within one diopter of the predictive spherical equivalent. Um, and then you can see down there uh, the post-op spherical equivalent for these patients as far as the 73 eyes receiving the monofocal non-torics uh, was um, minus uh, 0.17, which correlated pretty well with the different formulas um, closest to the Barrett uh, 2. And then as far as the toric eye wells, 95% um, of eyes were within one diopter of the predicted uh, spherical equivalent. Uh, the post-op residual uh, uh, stigmatism was about 0.33, uh, and then the post-op spherical equivalent was about uh, negative 0.3, and correlated well with the uh, pre-op expected uh, SE. Uh, these are results as far as the post-operative uh, best corrected visual acuity. Um, you can see most patients um, had visual acuity of uh, 2040 or better. All eyes with uh, best corrected visual acuity worse than 2040 had uh, ocular uh, comorbidities, including AMD and history of RBO. Uh, in two patients with torn posterior capsules, uh, the best corrected visual acuity was 2020 and uh, 2030. Um, and then there were no cases of endophthalmitis or uh, postoperative retinal detachment. Uh, this is just a, a scatter plot, um, kind of looking at the different formulas. You'll see the Barrett. Uh, I'm sure maybe this doesn't come up well on the screen, but uh, the Barrett formula, the Holiday 1 and then the Holiday 2, uh, and stratifying it based on short, medium, or long eyes. And long eyes were classified as eyes greater than um, 25 and sh uh, as far as axial length and short eyes less than 23. Um, and then based on the scatter plot, uh, you, we graphed uh, post-operative uh, spherical equivalent versus the expected uh, spherical equivalent. And the distribution is um, doesn't really show much variance. And I have a graph here. Um, which looks at uh, just kind of comparing the different formulas and um, essentially telling us if there was any major differences between the uh, mean absolute error uh, between the Barrett 1 holiday and, and the holiday 2. And so the, these graphs here are uh, the Krusak willis um, uh, sum tables. And uh, it's kind of hard to interpret, but essentially uh, for the Barrett um, uh, I, uh, formulas here, you can see there's not much variance between the short, medium, and long a little bit of a variance between the short, medium, and long uh, as far as the holiday one and holiday two as far as the difference between uh, expected spherical equivalent and post-op uh, spherical equivalent, but this was not statistically significant. Um, so long story short, there wasn't really much difference between the formulas and axial length as far as uh, the um, accuracy of these uh, formulas. Uh, so overall, the study demonstrated excellent refractive outcomes in resident cataract surgeries, uh, eyes receiving non-torics and uh, Torx had low amounts of residual stigmatism of about 0.33. Uh, there wasn't really a significant difference between the Holiday 1 and the Barrett formulas, at least in our study. Uh, previous studies have shown a superiority of uh, possibly the Barrett 2. Um, study population had higher rates of uh, higher order spherical, um, or high order aberrations rather, and that can be attributed to just kind of the high um, amount of dry eyes that we see in the patient, particularly living uh, in Utah here. And then the complications were low and comparable to previous uh, reported rates. Uh, one limitation of uh, this study was uh, exclusion of eyes with a um, uh, history of uh, prior refractive surgery. And we know that um, you know, refractive surgery is uh, kind of um, kind of going off right now. We see a lot of patients with RK, and then now we'll see more and more patients with LASIK and PRK as well. Um, eyes that received a myopic target or near target were not well represented in the study, and we had um, two patients um, that were included in our study. And then additional study of multifocal enhanced depth of focus in these light adjustable lenses, uh, which are available to our veterans free of cost, um, or again, not included in the study, is worth um, further pursuing. Um, you could argue that you have to be cautious of this patient population given the high amount of high order aberrations that we see at baseline and then kind of the high incidence of dry eyes, but it is worth exploring as well. Uh, these are my sources cited, and I'd like to thank um, Dr. Petty, um, Ariana Levin, uh, Benjamin Brintz, and uh, David Eddington, and would be happy to answer any questions. Mubarak, this is very reassuring data because residents at a VA, I mean, that's about as basic as you can get, and the data here is, is quite impressive looking at kind of what, what I consider the gold standard, which is the group at Baylor, 
uh, Mitch Weikert, our old fellow here, but also Lee Wang, Doug Koch, they've put together a tremendous amount of study looking at all the variables and trying to get our, you know, post-op refractive data um, as good as we can get. And the fact that, you know, we're within about 90% one diopter at a VA with residents, that's actually pretty good data. And that's pretty impressive considering that, that this is about, no offense to the residents, but about as basic as we can get in terms of looking at the data. And so what that tells us is we're doing quite a good job. Mubarak, thanks for presenting that work. Great job. I just wanted to mention in my own practice is that I think cataract surgery has become refractive cataract surgery across the board. I have patients that I see across the spectrum from Medicaid uninsured to, to insured, and everybody wants the best outcome, irregardless of the ability to pay or not. Hence, I think this is the, probably the most excited I've been about cataract surgery in a long time with our light adjustable technology. And we have the ability now to dial up within a quarter diopter or half a diopter of our intended target. And patients understand this and, and are willing to pay for it. And I think there's a, a, I think this is something that should be advocated for our veteran population. I would encourage you guys to pursue that as an option for our veterans to have the light adjustable technology available at the VA. And a lot of our pitfalls that we have with different formulas, all that will be forgiven with the light adjustable technology that we currently have. Hopefully in the future, there'll be others. I know we're waiting for perfect lens technology and, and refractive index shaping, but right now we have a technology that's available to even improve these outcomes even better for our veterans. So, so I know that uh, particularly Nick and Liliana have done a lot of work with perfect lens versus refractive index shaping. Of course, the advantage is, is that it, it'll work with standard lenses, um, and uh, the accuracy is actually even tighter. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, in the animal studies, uh, the standard deviation was down less than a tenth of a diopter, and if you use optical benches, uh, accuracy is probably more around five hundredths of a diopter. So, so why has that happened? Um, I I could go on and on to be a whole lecture of litany of of problems, but one thing that looks like it's going to be coming soon, and we'd be the will be the first place to get it, is something people don't realize. ANSI standards show that in a range of about twenty three diopters, that Companies don't have to generate them anymore with any tighter standards than plus or minus a half diopter. When you get up to uh, uh, lenses in the 28 power range or more ANSI standards are plus or minus one diopter. So we're fighting to get quarter diopter, or half diopter accuracy, and yet we could have lenses that we, you know, we're getting, we're ordering a 22, and it could be anywhere from a 21 and a half to 22 and a half. So uh, they can in vitro adjust lenses with incredible accuracy, five hundredths of a diopter, and, and soon there will be lenses in which you can get a lens and it will be guaranteed to five hundredths of a diopter. So, you know, you, you if you want to order, you say, really, it looks like the mean I want to be. I mean, at least that variable is removed. You might say it's probably too much of accuracy for the rest. But rather than guessing what power did I really have, if you order a 21.6, you're going to get a 21.6. So that's coming soon. It's it clearly going to happen with patients. It should have happened already by now. I, and by now I know how frustrated Nick is that that's not already out there. But it's an unstable platform uh, that's, that still hasn't happened. But I, I really think it's getting very, very close. But somehow adjusting it after surgery. Just as you know, Dr. Chaya said, as Craig said, is is what is going to get us that precision that patients reliably are going to expect in the future. We are running a tiny bit late, um, but I think it's always a sign for brilliant presentation if there is a, a vibrant discussion afterwards. We actually decided to do the break now, but we try to get back in about 10 minutes. Um, still the residents and also Dr. Olsen and our keynote speaker will have the pictures taken up at the bridge. Um, and there's one more thing I wanted to thank um, Chandler and particularly Megan, who took over the entire organization of the Resident Research Day about six weeks ago. And they really rocked it. <laughs>